So today we've got Mike from Topolytics. It's an absolutely fascinating company They're trying to map the world waste. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur. He has set up a number of different businesses, all within the sustainability sector, and has been doing that for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm really looking forward to I've known him for a few years now, and I'm really looking forward to talking to him and helping you understand um, more about well, wow, such an amazing character. Hi, Mike. Welcome to the Green Element podcast. Um, how are you today? I'm good, Will. Thank you very much. Nice day in Edinburgh for once. It is. It is. It was gorgeous yesterday. Um, we went for a walk on my other half's 40th birthday, which was lovely. But, um, Excellent. Um, so, tell us a bit about Topolytics and what you do and um, yeah, tell us a bit about it. Okay, um, we're trying to optimise the way um, commercial and industrial waste is managed. Um, and we're doing that with uh, data. So we're trying to acquire and then analyse um, better data on the sort of generation and the movements and the ultimate fate of um, commercial and industrial waste materials. Um, so we're a sort of data and analytics business. Um, and we're looking at a wide range of different waste streams because we think that that waste is a system. It's a system of movements of different materials. Sometimes they intersect, sometimes they go off in different directions. But, but still, you know, there are challenges with that system, as we've seen recently with stories about stockpiling of, of clinical waste, stockpiling of um, plastic waste, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, so we think a kind of system level look at the data uh, and the generation of a better data set um, can help um, the waste management industry uh, and companies that generate waste to make better decisions about what happens to that material because still a lot of that material is still going into landfill um, and clearly there's a lot of material also then going to energy from waste um, um, or refuse derived fuel or whatever you want to call it. Um, so we think there are opportunities to optimise um, that system. And so that's top politics. You, it's also, it's mapping it, isn't it? It's, um, it's understanding where it all goes, because you've done a ver variety of different projects. I think one with RBS, where you mapped all the waste that went around the UK, because it literally did go around the UK. Yeah, so, so our, our, our basic approach to this, um, you know, sort of looking at the system is, 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 is to map it. Um, or geospatial analytics, if you if you if you if you want if you want a fancier <laughs> term, um, but nobody understands that, so it's mapping. Um, yeah, because if you think about it, you have got you know in terms of the generation of all that kind of material, um, it's generated in multiple locations. You know, sort of individual bins, then put into into skips, and those skips are then moved somewhere else, and then they're maybe taken to a, um, a materials recovery facility. Um, and from there, they're, they're, they're separated and then they're sent off to different places for recovery, for recycling, um, or even obviously for refuse-derived fuel. Mm -hmm. so, so, that, you know, so that system of movements is really, really complex. And it's really opaque as well because, you know, the waste management industry, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not renowned for being the most sort of transparent uh, of industries. And, and obviously, we're seeing some sort of challenges around that. So, yeah. So our view is actually looking at it geospatially gives you a much better way to build um, a data model, to analyze, to visualize, and then to kind of generate some kind of um, useful kind of insights from that, from that data. And of course, those movements could be local, uh, they could be national, or they could obviously be international as, as well, as we've seen with challenges around um, plastics and, and card that have been sent to China for the last sort of 20 years, but that, now, you know, that stopped now. So the geography of waste, we think, is really, really crucial to understanding um, what happens and then to sort of making better decisions about it. And it will make, it will enable more recycling, won't it, and more reuse? Yeah, I mean, you know, I do, I do get the question a lot. It's like, well, Mike, that sounds really interesting, but, you know, so what? <laughs> uh, and of course, what we are ultimately trying to do, I mean, I think ultimately, I guess what, you know, we're all of us within this sustainability, within this environmental management, within this resource management space, you know, we are all trying to kind of optimize 
you know, the kind of the, the, the use of those resources, because we have a finite, um, you know, sort of level of resources globally. So we're all trying to do that. And so ultimately, I guess what we're trying to do is really trying to enable people to reduce the amount of waste that they're generating. Um, but that's, you know, there's a kind of, you know, there's a sort of, there's a whole bunch of steps, um, you know, before you get to that point. So we're starting with, okay, well, let's look at that system as it stands and try and optimize that, i.e. reduce the amount of material that's just being chucked away because that material has a value of, you know, sort of two, two trillion quid a year that's being kind of put into, into landfill sites. Is that just so, what you say? Drag some of that value, both in terms of the material itself, but also in terms of actually the financial and commercial value of that material, um, uh, and just kind of optimize that system. So yeah, so if that means we help to drive more recycling, we help to drive remanufacturing, uh, refurbishment, um, it's, it's really all about trying to maintain the, that material, or it could be products, you know, it could be assets at their highest utility, that's kind of what we're about, yeah. And you, you mentioned two trillion. Is that just the UK? No, I think that's a global figure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's various figures floating around. I mean, McKinsey have done some work on it, looking at trying to put a value on the, you know, a, you know, sort of based on kind of market prices on the material value that is kind of basically currently put into landfill sites. I mean, I mean, I think the numbers the numbers kind of vary, but. Either way, whichever way you look at it, it's a big number. And there's a lot of stuff that's being kind of put into holes in the ground that potentially, you know, might, might not be, you know, you know, could be recovered. And what sort of companies do you work with? So, yeah, so we're looking at commercial and industrial. So we tend to work at, certainly at this stage with, um, with larger sort of corporations that have got lots of waste, multiple sites, operate globally um, and they manage that waste in different ways you know sometimes they manage they have a kind of framework contract to manage everything through one you know one sort of supplier sometimes they each site will have its own autonomy to manage waste you know with you know with their own kind of contractors so so the kind of sectors they're in there'll be um, uh, food manufacturing um, Construction, um, obviously, that's a kind of big area in terms of um, waste generation. Sort of primary manufacturing, kind of metals, for example. Um, but we're also working with, you know, retailers as well. Uh, I mean, retailers is an interesting one because, of course, they are consumer-facing. Mm. Their waste streams are maybe not massively complex, but they have, you know, potentially thousands of sites. So the geography of, of the kind of flow of materials is quite complicated, even though the, you know, the types of waste may be sort of fairly inert. Whereas on, you know, in the manufacturing space, you might have a real mixture of complex waste streams plus kind of inert waste streams. So we are trying to sort of focus in on certain kind of sectors. Um, uh, but ultimately we think actually being able to see the system and see it as a system, we think, is the way to sort of start to kind of make better decisions. We think ultimately the value really will be to the industry itself. So that industry, the waste management industry is a big industry. You know, it's worth $500 billion a year globally. Um, it's a huge industry. Uh, but clearly that's coming under a lot of pressure to, to sort of change like a lot of in other industries. It's being hit with Industry 4.0, so Internet of Things, uh, data, analytics, robotics, all that wave is hitting the kind of waste management industry. So, so we're trying to enable, you know, a 21st century um, waste management industry where, you know, the models of waste management will be different. The way that waste is managed will be different. The way that waste is moved will be, will be different. So we're trying to say, well, let, let's get, get better data and drive a different sort of type of industry. So we think ultimately our customer will be the industry itself, will be investors into the waste management industry and will be regulators and policy makers as well. Mm. There are, that, there's a few companies that have got, they've got some kind of um, thing on, the, on all the bins. So they know exactly how much waste is going into the truck and what waste is going into the truck. And they've gone into quite a lot of granular data that must help you in in your process mapping 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the so-called internet of bins. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of work with, with IoT um, kind of sensors um, because, you know, we know that, you know, we're already starting to deal with a significant volume and velocity of, of, of data. But I think the thing about waste, as you, as you know, I mean, you, you know, you've kind of done a lot of work in this area too, is that it's quite a messy, mixed picture. Um, you know, different companies classify it in, diff even though there are schemes for classifying and measuring, you know, people take a sort of slightly different approach. So, yeah, so on, on the one hand, you could have systems, IoT, bin sensors, which tell you, you know, whether the bin is full or not, and it's, you know, it helps to schedule the sort of collection of that material. As yet, those systems aren't really telling us what's in the bin. It's telling us whether the bin is full, but it's not really saying, saying what's in the bin. So that's useful, but we don't think it's the, at the moment, it's, it's not giving us the, the, all the answers. So we need to look at it from a whole bunch of different, different ways. And that's why we think actually looking at patterns in the data um, is the way to start to unlock, you know, some, you know, some of the inconsistencies and potentially some of the opportunities in that. Um, but certainly the IOT piece, is gonna is gonna grow and expand as it is in any other industries. Hmm. Here's an idea. You know how you um, there are people that are coming up. You can take photos of flowers and take photos of uh, meals that you eat, and it analyzes it and it knows exactly what's in that meal or it knows what that flower is or the plant is and stuff. You could have like some kind of camera that sits on um, a very thin camera that goes alongside the bin. So when you chuck things in, it knows everything that goes in. And it analyzes it, and then it just records everything that's gone into that bin at all times. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the knowing what's in there is is the sort of I think is the is the key mm. um, because that's the key to then deciding. Well, does it need to be in there in the first place? You know that that, that first question. And then if it does, well, should it be in there? Should or should it be somewhere else? You know, should we be source separating waste before it, before it then you know is taken away somewhere else? Because uh, obviously, as you know, one of the big problems with waste is mixed, is, is, is contamination, you know, where kind of material is mixed together. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's some work being done on optical systems for sort of trying to kind of identify what's, what's you know, in a sort of, in, a, in the waste stream. I think quite a bit of work's been done there in terms of, um, at, you know, when they're sorting waste using kind of optical systems and robotic systems for sort of separating the waste, because that process is still quite manual. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, potentially not the nicest job in the world in terms of sort of picking out, you know, bits and pieces of contaminated um, waste. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely all sorts of te technological um, opportunities there. And, and I think that is going to come. So over the next kind of five or ten years, you're going to see a lot more of that. But in, the, in, the, in that period, you know, you're still dealing with a lot of um, kind of messy kind of data because you're dealing with a lot of messy mixed materials. And how do you engage your staff, um, suppliers? I mean, how big, I mean, how big, how big are you? Are you, um, uh, we're, we're tiny. Uh, I mean, there's, there's four of us at the core and then we work with a whole bunch of other, um, um, kind of people as well, you know, with sort of different different expertise from waste management to analytics to data to software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so we're a sort of classic, you know, kind of startup in that way. Even though we have been around for a couple of years, but um, but you know, so um, uh, in terms of the engagement bit, um, it's interesting at the moment. I mean, you 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 again, you know, you work in this, you know, in this in this field. I mean. Clearly, there's a bit of a zeitgeist at the moment um, around waste. Um, you know, obviously, David Attenborough, you know. <laughs> we could not mention him, could we? Um, arguably, the world's greatest environmental communicator has, you know, sort of switched everyone on to the sort of ocean plastics um, kind of issue. Um, but then, obviously, we've seen in the UK, we've seen issues with the stockpiling, you know, this whole issue with clinical waste, the issues with plastic waste being stockpiled, these because it can't be exported to, to China. So there's a lot of awareness out there at the moment. Um, and it's inter so it's interesting, actually. So the engagement bit, I'm finding quite easy because people are going, yeah, wow, waste, it's really important, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
you know, and um, whilst it's always been important, um, you, you know, perhaps it's been seen as being a bit of a sort of, you know, kind of, you know, strange subject. In fact, somebody said to me uh, recently, they said, um, did you meet your wife when, before or after you started doing this work with Topolitics, Mike? And uh, I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, waste management. <laughs> So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so the engagement bit is actually, at the moment, getting a foot in the door is, is quite, quite easy because people are kind of switching on to the fact that, particularly in the corporate sector, that, you know, there are, there are opportunities around waste because they're spending a lot of money on waste management. They want to do, be more resource efficient. Clearly, as, as we know, collectively, there's this whole push around the circular economy. So we are a C100 company with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which kind of, you know, puts us up there as sort of one of the world's kind of leading sort of innovators around circular economy. Um, um, so that's, that's, I think, starting to have a sort of a big impact. And, you know, you'll have seen the recent thing uh, announcement that the, the sort of global commitment around the, a new plastics economy that the, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has been really sort of championing and, 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 and pushing where you know we need to move away from the sort of current model of sort of hydrocarbon sort of plastic based you know sort of um, industry and change that change the way that kind of industry operates uh, in order to try and you know kind of reduce the amount of kind of waste that is kind of leaking out of the system so so I think all those things combined I think mean that you know we certainly get a you know we're certainly getting a you know there is a receptive ear to what to, to, to what we're doing within the sort of um, kind of corporate uh, and, and commercial space, and I think that is also starting to play out within the waste management industry as well, which is starting to kind of recognise that actually, yeah, that there must be, you know, clearly there are challenges there, but but there there clearly must be opportunities um, um, around you know kind of new models of of um, waste management. And you, I would say that you're probably one of the best placed people to try and change or spearhead change in the waste management world because you've run, correct me if I'm wrong, you've run a PR company, you've run a sustainability consultancy, and you also manufacture um, through your child's seats. So therefore, you kind of have a skill set of lots and lots of things that all will have an effect on how you're able to change. Uh, I've, I've, also, I've also set up a cinema company as well. Have uh, you? I didn't know that. <laughs> Check out the LinkedIn profile. Um, yeah, well, actually, the PR company and the, the, the sustainability, it was a consultancy that we set up. Um, it was my first company, which was um, Great Circle, which was a, it was a sustainability and environmental communications business. So yeah. we, we, this, was, this was 20 years ago. And we sort of thought, actually, it came out of, I, I, I used to work in Indonesia. I, I, I um, ran a forest certification, of the FSC uh, program for um, um, a big Swiss inspection company in, in Southeast Asia. So I helped to develop the principles and criteria of the Forest Stewardship Council, the sort of mid-90s. And then we, I ran some of the very early audits in, 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 in Southeast Asia. Uh, but I also did environmental management systems. And... ISO 14001. And one of the things that struck me doing that was that one of the big challenges, as you well know, as well, around environmental management, you know, you know, I've been called a tree hugger so many times. So I just show them pictures of me standing next to tropical trees, you know, because it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I didn't hug, you know, I helped to manage them. But um, is, is communication. Is behavior change you know it's one of the kind of big big things so and with 14,001 I thought well actually there's a clause in there which talks about communication but every time you ask somebody about well how do you communicate this stuff in order to generate the sort of change that you want to generate around you know within the management system so well we've got a complaints book it's like oh right okay so I thought, is that it you know so, so I thought well, there's a whole industry out there whether you want to call it PR or corporate comms or whatever that is actually professionalizes the way you can communicate and influence. So if you put those two together, then you can maybe start to sort of generate kind of change around, you know, attitudes to sustainability too. And that's what Great Circle is about. But what we ended up doing, we ended up doing a lot of sustainability reporting. So the big annual sustainability reports that nobody reads, that are very expensive um, to, to produce. 
Um, and that was the business. We sold that business to, um, to a financial and investor commerce business back in the day. So, yeah, so, so absolutely, my view is, is that the communications piece within the kind of work that you do, that I do, you know, within our world of sustainability or environmental management, um, resource efficiency, communication is crucial, you know, because if you can't communicate, you're not going to change anybody's attitudes or behaviours, are we? And that, that is one of the big challenges, I think, fundamentally around the whole climate change debate is, you know, it's it argument, you know, that, you know, putting forward arguments, um, influencing, changing behaviours, you know, it's a massive, massive challenge. So, so that, that's one side of it. The other side you mentioned, top seat, the, the fabric chair harness for babies who lunch, um, which is a market leading um, um, sort of chair harness for, you know, children that where you don't have a high chair, um, you can safely anchor your child in a, in a fabric, uh, in this sort of fabric product, in a normal chair. And we sell that all over the world. And we've, we, we are living the globalization dream on that one, you know, and we sort of manufacture it um, and we ship it all over the world and everything else. So we've learned a lot about trying to run a manufacturing business in as ethical and as responsible a way as possible in terms of using um, sort of environmental friendly sort of textiles and inks and dyes and, and, uh, and everything else. But it's very, very challenging when you're a small company. So, so that's taught us a lot. Um, so when I talk to manufacturers and people making products, to a certain extent we have, you know, you know, in our own way, we've been through that, that, that cycle in terms of testing, manufacturing, shipping, you know, exporting, et cetera, et cetera. So, so yeah, I think all of those experiences, you know, certainly help in terms of, um, what we're doing now. I think people always like to listen to someone who's an expert that's kind of been there, done that, rather than listen to someone that is, has read a book about it and has decided that they now know how to help them. That's from my experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, to be perfectly honest, I think certainly when it comes to business, most all of my experience is just, you know, I've been involved in running, setting up, selling one <laughs> um, businesses for the last 20 years. And it's all self taught really. Uh, I mean, obviously I read around it and I go to, I do, you know, I do go to meetings and, and done the occasional course, but, but absolutely it's, 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 it's all been learned on the, on the hoof. Yeah. And of course, you know, made masses of mistakes, you know, loads of mistakes. Um, and, but hopefully, hopefully kind of learn from that as well. Um, so going, but, yeah. going yeah. on from that, what would be one piece of advice you could give our listeners <laughs> and help them with their purpose, thinking about those mistakes that you've, that you've made? Um, but it, advice in relation to what, though? In relation to guess, business or in relation... Yeah, I guess in relation to business and running, sustainable, running a sustainable business. Okay, um, and I still make this mistake, is number one, don't, don't sell yourself short. I'm constantly doing that. I'm constantly doing that, but that's just me, I guess. Number two, persevere. I mean, I think one of the things about entrepreneurship that it's one of the qualities of entrepreneurship that, that is sort of almost like the elephant in the room. People don't really tend to focus on it because it's, it's you know, people see the successful entrepreneurs and they see, wow, look at the success and look at them doing great things and everything else. But of course, they don't see the 10 years of, of yeah. progress that you've had to kind of wade through in order to sort of get to that point. You know, and that idea that everyone is a 10 year overnight success. I mean, it absolutely does take longer to build something. You know that. I mean, you're, you know, building, building a business. I mean, it takes longer yeah. and it's harder it longer than you think. Uh, and you have to make massive sacrifices. And so it's not easy because I think if it was easy, of course, everyone would be doing it. And um, so perseverance, I think, is, 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 is an oft um, uh, ignored quality of entrepreneurship. Um, everyone thinks hey, it's all whizzy ideas and innovation and excitement, but actually a lot of it is about just because there are so many setbacks along the way um, uh, that you know constantly. You know, you're constantly battling that. You know, and at the end of the day, what you're constantly battling is what's up here. You know, that's really where the battle is. You know, because you, you're bound to be dealing with rubbish. You know, bat, you know, sort of poor decision making. 
um, you know, um, difficult people, blah, 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 blah. That, all that's the external environment, but actually it all comes back to, you know, what, what's going on up here, really. Um, so perseverance is the other thing. Um, but I think the other thing about sustainability businesses and, and, and sort of environmental management focused businesses, and, and we certainly saw this with our, because we, we did a lot of work with those kind of companies with our original consultancy, and sometimes I think there is, because what we are doing collectively, we think is really important, <laughs> you know, and we think, you know, we, but, but that isn't reason enough, you know, that, that alone will not help you to grow a business. Whether that business is a social enterprise or whether it's a for-profit enterprise, that is not reason enough because most of the people out there don't feel the same way. So you've still got to have that really commercial you know you still got to have that sort of commercial um sort of trick within you know within 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 the business um even though you might be doing something that is you know fundamental to the way materials are going to be managed to the way carbon is managed to the way you know um water is is managed etc 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 so so i think that keeping that sort of commercial kind of aspect in it, it, it to the forefront is, is absolutely, is absolutely vital as well. Okay. Brilliant. Um, so <laughs> running Topolitics, yeah. if you think about the environmental management and your carbon footprint when you're, um, when you're working out, I know you're only a small team, but um, there are so many people that are small teams that do like to think about how they do it. I mean, what sort of things do you do from an environmental management carbon footprinting kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, talk about, yeah, practice what you preach, Mike, practice what you preach. <laughs> um, okay, well, well, I suppose from a personal point of view, I mean, I, uh, my view on this is that actually, it, you know, again, it comes back to this idea that everyone's sort of almost like, we're, we're, we're all trying to be perfect, <laughs> you know, in, in relation to our sort of footprints. But of course, perfection is just, you know, we're not going to get there. So we all have to kind of compromise in relation to, the way we run, run, run a business. And, you know, my view on this is that, you know, it's a horses for courses thing. You know, if you're a big business with lots of sort of resources and systems, you can systematize a lot of this stuff. So you can systematize, you know, obviously we see a lot of companies that are trying to systematize the, uh, the way they manage, um, you know, transport across and within the business. So trying to move away from, you know, um, changing vehicle fleets or moving away from different, to different models of, um, you know, sort of vehicle use, encouraging public transport, etc. So we, so we try and do that as much, much as we, we we can. I mean, we're in a building. We we rent a small office in a in a building that's probably not optimised for sort of energy efficiency. <laughs> I have to say. So so I think there are some kind of real challenges around that. Um, but I, so I, I think we try and systematize it and measure as well as we can, but we could definitely be, be doing more. But as our business grows, we will systematize that more. Uh, and obviously, you know, your, um, your carbon um, sort of management and measurement system that you're launching, I think is a really kind of, you know, for someone like us, I think it's a really kind of useful thing because a lot of that stuff is just, you know, a lot of that stuff is kind of, you know, unattainable for a business of our size so um so i think so my view on it is that you just need to sort of it's a horses for courses thing you 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 need to sort of do what you can with the resources that you have but always be mindful that actually there may be alternative ways of traveling of um you know so actually sort of operating um the business it almost change on a weekly basis as well yeah, and, and also it's all compromise, you know, um, you know, perhaps my dirty secret, because it's not so much a secret, is that I've got a pilot's license. So, <laughs> you know, so, you know, so, you know, so, um, yeah, well, but I love like electric planes in the future. I love, I love flying. And, and actually, when you look at what, you know, around, you know, the footprint of, of, of aviation, you know, I still fly to get from A to B. You know, we, we still believe that we have a global opportunity in terms of our business. We operate internationally. I fly places. Mm. You know, I don't beat myself up about that because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is trying to affect change in other ways. So it's all about, you know, there's, there's an element of sort of compromise, I think, um, uh, along the way the purists might well disagree with me but 
Um, but as you say, aviation's changing. You know, the whole, mm. you know, look at, you know, look at fuels, uh, look at, um, obviously, as you say, you know, electrification of aviation. Wow, that's really interesting to, to, to explore as well. So, uh, it's a re- yeah, so it's a really sort of complex picture. And I don't think there are any sort of simple, straightforward answers. What, mate, what got you into sustainability? What would you, what would you say was your tipping point? Um, well, do you know what? I, I'm a geographer. So I think geography was always a bit of a sort of environmental science back in the day. Um, so, you know, because I have an interest in the world, I've got an interest in what's going on in the world, the way the world works, the way people interact with the natural environment, which is kind of what geography is all about. Check out my TEDx, why geography is going to save the world. Um, so I think that- can you give us a link and we'll put it in the show notes there? Uh, yeah, 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 I can, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, if you search for um, saving the world with geography, Mike Rose, <laughs> you'll probably find it. Um, so, yeah, so, so I guess I've always kind of come from that, come, I've come from that angle and I think that's probably where it, where it originally um, came from. In terms of um, the sort of actually working in that, in that field, I remember I did a PhD in, um, using aerial photographs to uh, map forest condition, uh, forest decline in Germany. Remember the days of acid rain damage, but uh, in Germany they they were really good at sort of, because of course forestry is so important as a cultural and economic um, um, sort of entity within within Germany that they developed these amazing systems for for monitoring um, trees from from satellites and aerial photos. So I learned from from them and, um, and I came out of that and somebody said to me, so what sort of what sort of job do you want to go into? And I said, you know what, I'd like to go into environmental management. This is twenty years ago, twenty five years ago probably. And the, and and they said they leaned forward and they said, Sonny, I think you should go and get yourself a proper job. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but then I, I had my I had my revenge in my own head when I was passing through um, Preston Station about two years ago, and I saw one of these big adverts for a jobs website, you know, and it had a little field, search field, and you t- had to type in what sort of job you were looking for. And they actually had in this advert, environmental consultant. <laughs> I thought, wow, you know, it's a pretty job. <laughs> um, so, so that, yeah, so to a certain extent, it came from that. And then, um, yeah, so I, I guess I'd always, I'd always sort of come at it from, the, from, from, the, from that direction. But the thing is, what I've always said is when I've been accused of being a tree hugger, you know, yes, I've worked in forestry, but, you know, I'm not doing this out of the goodness of my own heart. I actually believe that there is a big economic and commercial opportunity out there, but, you know, in terms of, you know, the idea that we can manage resources better, you know, we can, you know, we can manage our footprints better, and we can still, you know, generate economic, you know, there's a gen- an economic upside to that. So I do, you know, I do believe that not that we can have our cake and eat it. But I think there is, you know, there's clearly, you know, economic and commercial opportunity there in terms of, um, you know, in terms of envir- the environment and sustainability. What's the, what would be one thing that you'd like people to take away from this podcast to do or, yeah, to action? Um, well, okay. Uh, from a purely selfish point of view, if you if you know of any companies uh, that are interested in understanding a bit more about their their waste and what happens to that waste and doing different things with it, then I would encourage them to get in touch via toppolitics.com. Um, but I think it, just in terms of, um, uh, I guess it comes back to thinking about sustainability and where where we're going with that. Is it's this idea of you know let's not sell you know those of us that kind of work in this in this field let's not sell ourselves short but let's not assume that 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 everybody out there is going to sort of buy into our you know our our vision our mission you know you know we need to sort of work really hard at that so the whole communications piece is is is, is absolutely vital important but you know. Um, I'm not a religious man by any means, but, you know, keep the faith, keep the faith because, you know, there is, you know, there is a job to be done, but there is a huge opportunity out there. So, um, so anybody that's thinking about, um, you know, starting up a business or, uh, you know, kind of becoming, you know, doing the entrepreneur thing, 
you know, take a look at sustainability, take a look at clean tech, take a look at that whole kind of field because there's some really, really exciting stuff happening, some amazing tech happening, lots of stuff, you know, as, as per, you know, your thing around, you know, sort of carbon management and footprinting, lots of stuff around, you know, the whole renewable energy piece, lots of stuff around um, recycling and reuse of materials, lots of stuff around water conservation and water, water quality. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there um, that's just, you know, waiting to be kind of dealt with. So I think there's kind of huge opportunity there. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much today. Thank you, no worries. Thank you for um, coming on the podcast. And yeah, thanks for letting us know on how and what you're doing through Topolitics. Well, thank you. Thanks, Will. I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, well, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, see you soon. Cool. Cheers. All right. Cheers, Will. See ya. Thanks so much for listening. We created this podcast for you. So we'd really appreciate any feedback you want to give us. You can do that by rating and reviewing on your favourite podcast or for iTunes, visit www.greenelement.co.uk forward slash apple. If you'd like to keep in touch, then we invite you to join our free Facebook community, which is everything to do with sustainable and ethical business. Lots of daily conversations, themes and great ideas. A really great place to work and network with like-minded individuals. If you open Facebook and search for the green element, hit the group search function, we will let you right in. All of the show notes, any links, any references to the, on this podcast will be featured on our website greenelement.co.uk As a special thank you for listening, please head over to www.greenelement.co.uk forward slash podcast 2018 and you can pick up a free guide on how to green up and environmentalise your business or organisation. That's greenelement.co.uk forward slash podcast 2018 Finally, I would like to thank Ben Chatwin for writing the fantastic opening music. He is an amazing artist with a phenomenal following. It was a privilege he said yes to even write it for us. We look forward to seeing you next week and hope you have a wonderful day.